All right, well, if you are new to joining us or you're just catching up with us the last couple of weeks, we start the uh, year off typically with something that I just have a burden for, for us as a church. Uh, this year, we started with the mindset of we're starting a new decade, 2020 is upon us, if you can believe that. That, that, sounds like, that still sounds like a science fiction number to me, right? Like, how did we get here? This is a Star Trek thing. But here we are, starting a new decade. Uh, and the series that uh, we're walking through is really just staring intently at a particular passage that Jesus spoke to us about that's just rich with content that we're going to need over the next decade. It's the passage that Evan referenced it this morning. I don't know if we have it up there or not. Yeah. Uh, it's Jesus' invitation to come to him. All who labor and are heavy laden. And to engage him in such a way that our souls could find rest. And I, I call this series Coming and Going because in the next decade, we're going we're to come to some things. It's just what we do. When our soul is in need, when we bump into stuff on the inside, it's not working right. We, we come to something to try and get some help. And then we go to live life, right? We're on a mission. We try to find purposeful things to get involved with, with our lives. And we did that in the last decade. I don't know if you kind of surveyed the last decade to see what did you come to in the last decade? And what, what missions did you go on in the last decade? How many of you guys would be surprised if you surveyed the last 10 years of your life and in 2010, you had no idea how much time you would spend coming to Facebook or coming to Instagram? I mean, in 2010, you just weren't thinking that you would eventually live a life that carved out faithfully every day a certain amount of time in order for you to thumb through Facebook and Instagram feeds faithfully every day. You just weren't thinking that's what I was going to be coming to that a lot in the next decade. It just happened, right? It just became part of the lifestyle that we're living. All right, well, it's 2020, and I don't know what's going to happen between now and 2030, but we're going to come to some stuff, right? Our, our daily lives are going to engage some things along the way in the next decade, and those things are going to inspire us to live for some things. We're going to go on some kind of a mission that we find valuable, that we find meaning in, right? So we're going to come and go in the next decade, just like we did in the last decade. And this passage just gives us some wonderfully helpful insights. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Let me just read verse 28 and 29 today. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray together. Lord, we are here this morning, just a, a, a gathering of individuals in different places, yet living similar life. And Lord, we are feeling our lives right now. Maybe some are feeling relieved feeling excited, feeling on top of things. Maybe others are here this morning, feeling under the weight, feeling labors, feeling burdens, having concerns. Uh, Lord, you speak to us with an invitation. You recognize a need that's in our hearts, a need to find rest. And so, Lord, we want to travel down the roadway this verse paves for us. We want to find the rest you're talking about. So Lord, open our hearts, open our lives, give grace to us this morning to hear from you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to move to this next aspect of what Jesus is going to say about this finding rest, and immediately he links rest to learning. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. All of us want rest. I'm not sure all of us are eager as much to sign on for the learning process, but can you just give me rest for sure? That's, I'm interested in that. But we need to learn some things. John Calvin opens his Institutes of the Christian Religion this way. He says, our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts. The knowledge of God 
and of ourselves. But as these are connected together by many ties, it's not easy to determine which of the two precedes and gives birth to the other. The infinitude of good which resides in God becomes more apparent from our poverty. In particular, the miserable ruin into which the revolt of the first man has plunged us compels us to turn our eyes upward. Right? Our awareness of what we are missing is what drives us to a God who has what we're looking for. But vice versa, our lack of awareness will also keep us from pursuing him. Even the song that Eric taught us this morning. I am weak. You are strong. Jesus, come and take it all. It starts with a self-revelation, right? It starts with me being aware of my own weakness. Calvin goes on and says, Indeed, we cannot aspire to him in earnest until we have begun to be displeased with ourselves. For what man is not disposed to rest in himself? Who, in fact, does not thus rest so long as he is unknown to himself? That is, so long as he is contented with his own endowments and unconscious or unmindful of his misery. Every person, therefore, on coming to the knowledge of himself is not only urged to seek God, but is also led as by the hand to find him. Right? It's interesting, Jesus gives an invitation here, but it's a narrow invitation. He didn't just say, come, anybody, come. Although I think the, the scriptures do have that tone to it in many, many places. But in this passage, he invites those who have a sense of self-awareness. They are restless on the inside. They are laboring. They are burdened. As we've read in scripture, they're under the groanings of creation. They're in touch with the fact that, hey, I have not figured my life out. I can't make all this stuff work. This is confusing and it's hard. There are troubling elements to me and my life. Hey, listen, that, that might feel like a bad place, but here's some good news about that bad place. You're not coming to Jesus until you're aware of that about yourself. If you think you got enough in your own personal bank account, so to speak, to take care of the needs that are coming your way in your life, you're not coming to anybody. You're going to that account. If you got enough strength, if you got enough wits about you, you got enough connections, you know how to work the system, you can manipulate people and circumstances like nobody else can, and you just keep, quote, fixing your own world, you're not coming to Jesus because, you know, part of coming to Jesus, is we're going to learn next week, has a yoke attached to it. And it's going to put you into an agreement with someone. And, you know, if I want to run my own show, I don't really want to be in agreement with anybody else. I want permission just to do it my own way. But when I don't have the resources to do it my own way, I know that I got to look outside myself. I need, this is, and this is bad news that leads to good news, right? When you come in contact with the fact that your own life is frustrating you, is wearing you out, you've shed tears, you have broken things in your life, broken relationships, broken stories. That doesn't, you know, I just, just used a bunch of words that none of us are like, hey, where do I sign on for that? None of us want those things, but it's when you get to that place, when you look up and you say, God, I can't do this, God, you're going to have to show up. And Jesus speaks into that group. And then he quickly says, I know what you need. You need rest in your soul. And then the next thing he's going to say is take my yoke on you and learn from me. Right? We'll talk next week about what this yoke is. But Jesus gives an invitation to rest by telling us to come and learn. Right? So I want to say rest is related to learning. Right? Can we all buy into this concept? Jesus doesn't just say, hey, come to me, just kind of get in the neighborhood, you know, live at an address that's nearby and you'll just suddenly have rest. He's like, no, come to me and learn and you'll find rest. So in some ways, some of us might need to back up and rethink some things about what it was that we were doing when we came to Christ. 
Because it may be that our ability to rest in him and do life is being broken up and confused and messed with by our lack of learning. We just don't know him all that well, but we really want to find rest. Right? So this is a message about learning, right? Learn from me. Jesus said, and in the next decade, and I hope you, you feel this way too, I want to arrive in 2030 looking back over my decade and say learning was a priority for me. And I don't mean just life learning. I mean learning from Jesus was a priority for me. I was intentional about that. It didn't just accidentally happen. It happened because I saw the invitation and the value that's there. Now, now listen, there are certain words I want to say that hang around the, uh, the entry doorway into Christianity, right? You know, on your way into the theme park, there are certain words that get featured when you come to Jesus, right? One of them is the word come. It is the invitation of God that you are taking him up on when you come. But you know, there are words near the front door of Christianity that some of us may have walked past too quickly. There are words like repent, Right? If you guys read very far in the Bible, when Jesus goes to inaugurate the kingdom, he uses the word repent. Now just stick with me. If you're John Calvin and you're saying, hey, there's this, this thing about wisdom that involves two parts. There's a, there's a God knowledge and a self knowledge. What do you think that word repent is featuring? Well, kind of both. Because you can't repent in any direction. You have to turn to God. But you have to turn away from something about yourself. How many people think, you know, they come to Christ with very little awareness of what it is about your own life that you're being called to turn away from? So the Bible features words like repent. Right at the front doorway on the way into the theme park is the word believe. Right? Jesus summons us to faith. But it's not just faith in being positive. It's not just believe something religious. It's faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's taking him up on the fact that he is who he said he is. So you're not really a Christian if you believe something different about this Jesus than what the Bible says. Even if you were drawn to some presentation, you went to church and there was this presentation that was made that talked a lot about how much life can hurt and you're in trouble and you're like, amen, yes, that's me. And you, you heard this invitation and you signed on for something, but it didn't si sound like you were signing on for turning away from anything or believing in particular in something about Jesus. Or this word today, learning. I'm telling you what Christianity really gets, it gets a bad association with. Uh, foxhole conversions, right, where our life gets so bad that we'll try anything. And we go to church, and we hear some message, and we respond by saying, hey, hey, whoever Jesus is and whatever it is that he did and whatever's going on in my world, I, where do I sign? And, you know, you, you weren't reading not the fine print, but the large print very carefully, Jesus comes to you, there's something about him, and that's in the verses right before it, that gives him permission to say, hey, take my yoke on you. He has claims on our lives. He is a particular person. So sometimes in our crisis, we don't read any of that. We just say, hey, all I know is I'm hurting. Can you just come deal with this wound in my life? And, and that's not a bad recognition to come to and begin to pursue Christ. But this is an invitation to learn. Take my yoke on you and learn from me. Right? Some of us may be here today that, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we confessed Christ for the first time and came into this relationship with Christ. But was, was learning a priority from that day forward? Or was it just, I just want to come to Jesus, I just want to, I want to respond to him. And that's critically important. But the fullness of Jesus' invitation is not just to come get near him and sign something. It's to learn from him. So vitally linked to our Christian life is learning, right? This word learn is the Greek word in the scriptures, manthano. It's where we get the word disciple from. Right, a quick definition that's in your outline there. It means to direct one's mind to something, right? To engage my thinking, to turn it to Jesus. 
It means to accustom oneself to something. Right? Can you imagine Jesus is different than a lot of things that you and I get around? To accustom myself to him and what he's like. To experience him. Come learn from me is an invitation to experience Christ. And come and understand. Right? Leon Morris in this passage says, Throughout this gospel there is an emphasis on learning. On being a disciple and the like. And the verb here is cognate with disciple. It means learn through instruction. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a disciple and therefore a learner. It's not enough to indicate that one would like to be a follower of Jesus. To commit oneself to him means to commit oneself to a learning process. It's kind of important in our day and age especially where we we get to self-define so many things that we don't self-define Christianity. That we don't come up with our own version and and just put that on top of whatever it is that we're calling Christianity. Christianity is this. It means to commit oneself to a learning process. It means to come into a relationship with Christ that involves learning the rest of my life and I can say the rest of eternity is going to be me learning and learning and learning and taking on more and more and more about Christ. Right, so this is, this is critical to understanding what Christianity ever really is. Right, two statements here in your outline. One, coming to Jesus means thrusting our souls into a process of learning. Fresh ideas, fresh angles on why things are the way they are and what they're supposed to be like anyway. What, what do you expect from your life? What do you think that's going to be like? What's your approach? How should you do some of the things that you do? Or if you come and learn from Jesus, he might bump into some of those ideas, right? I wrote in your outline there, it means inviting a clash of ideas. You are inviting that. Come to me, Jesus says, and learn from me. How many of you guys know you've got ideas that are going to clash with Jesus' ideas? It means taking the risk that our core ideas, our preferential ideas, our traditional ideas, our safe ideas will more than likely be impacted, tweaked, or completely discarded by learning from Jesus. Remember, Jesus didn't mind having a large audience and saying, hey, listen, you have heard it said, but I say, Jesus had no problem turning people's ideas upside down. And that's not an unloving thing to do if the people you're speaking to have bad ideas. Don't overvalue ideas that don't come from God. Don't fall in love with them. They're they're not bad, but they don't lead to life. So Jesus has no problem coming and saying, hey, that right there, that's a bad idea. This is what I had in mind. That right there, don't do that. This is what I'm calling you to. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18 says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it's written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. All right, how many of us recognize we live in a world? We're like walking antennas. We we walk around and there's broadcasts coming to us all the time. We absorb these ideas. We begin to think they sound reasonable. That's not a bad approach. Ooh, I've never thought about it that way, but that could be really helpful. And we begin to live our lives out of these ideas. Have I learned which one of these ideas, right? The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. But do I know that some of these things are futile? Uh, I don't always know when they're futile. So when you and I come to Jesus and learn from him, there's going to be a clash of ideas. Now listen, this is where the clash comes from. It comes from the way I am as an individual, the things that wire me, make me a certain way, make me bent in a certain direction, the experiences that I had growing up, all the stuff that makes me an individual. And so it's going to clash with that. 
and it's going to clash with the sound of the culture around me. Right? The collection of humanity and the individuals of humanity. When Jesus begins to teach us, those things are going to come into a collision with his ideas. Right? Well, be prepared for that. Right? I was reading Tim Keller's book on preaching recently. He says it's about preaching. I think it's what the intention of God challenging us is. Preaching, he says, it's also proclaiming. Preaching compellingly, engaging the culture and touching hearts. He says a good sermon is like a, a sword that cuts to the heart. It's much more complicated than is usually recognized. Preaching to the heart and to the culture are linked because cultural narratives profoundly affect each individual sense of identity, conscience, and understanding of reality. If you come to Jesus and learn from him, do you recognize that you're probably going to unlearn some things? You're going to be okay with that. Because right? I've fallen in love with a lot of my ideas. Because they, they suit me, right? They, they make me feel safe. Or they further some interest of mine, right? They're, they're, they're built out of me. They're made of my stuff. And then I've listened to others and I've borrowed their ideas as I've heard people share their ideas and I listen to the culture speak and I borrow some of that. I, I might have to have some unlearning happen if I'm going to learn from Jesus. You've heard it said, but I say, right? So don't be freaked out when you get around Jesus and you've got to unlearn some ideas. Coming to Jesus, and you're all on a put, means embracing the rigors of disciplined learning. This is not popular. I mean, we just want Jesus to show up and, you know, throw some pixie dust all over our lives and just do stuff that we're not even paying attention to, but suddenly it's different. But Jesus invites us to him and immediately says, I, I, I want to give you rest. Let's get about learning some things. So he invites you to enroll in the school of Jesus. How many of you guys love those words, enrolling in school? Right? They still, <laughs> they still make me do something weird bodily. <laughs> I don't like the concept. Right? I don't want to enroll in something. I, I have memories of the pressures of that massive term paper that needed to be done and how many citations you needed to have and the hours you're going to spend or, or finals week was coming and you just you spent weeks in this learning mode of cramming ideas and getting thoughts fixed in your head that, that doesn't appeal to me as a matter of fact I have memories when I was at LSU I have memories of finals week followed by when I'd finish my last exam I would load up my pockets with as many quarters as I could stick in them I would go to the student center and I would mindlessly play Pac-Man and Donkey Kong for hours until my quarters ran out right I just at this point and I gave myself permission to do that because I figured I just want my brain to disengage <laughs> I don't want to learn anything else <laughs> I mean, hours later, that's what I'm doing. But how about the thought that Christianity, following Jesus, knowing him, involves learning, disciplined learning, intentional learning, learning that really, really matters. J.I. Packer in his excellent book, Knowing God, says, but wait a minute, says some. Why need anyone take time off today for the kind of study you propose? Surely a lay person at any rate can get on without it. The questioner clearly assumes that a study of the nature and character of God will be, listen, impractical and irrelevant for life. Right? This kind of gives away what information we choose to get around, right? Right? If we don't get around a lot of God information and a lot of learning from Jesus because we sort of feel like, I don't really need that to do life. It's not the kind of stuff I need to make room for. I, you know, I need to have other information. Packer says, in fact, however, it is the most practical project anyone can engage in. Knowing God is crucially important for the living of our lives. 
as it would be cruel to an Amazonian tribesman to fly him to London, put him down without explanation in Trafalgar Square and leave him as one who knew nothing of English or England to fend for himself. So we are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing about the God whose world it is and who runs it. The world becomes a strange, mad, painful place and life in it a disappointing and unpleasant business for those who do not know about God. Right? How many of our labors and our heavy laden lives and the burdens that we're under are, are there because we have misunderstood what life was meant to be and we're laboring to make it something else. We're under the burdens of things that are never going to satisfy us and they're going to be futile and we're going to labor and work and labor and work and at the end of that exercise, we're going to discover that wisdom was futile. It didn't do for me what I hoped it would do. I've arrived at where it said I was supposed to go and I'm still not happy. Well, we're kind of like the Amazonian tribesmen, right? Dropped into a world that is God's and yet we don't know him. Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life, blindfolded as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This way, you can waste your life and lose your soul. And Jesus wants our souls to find, find rest. But he says, learning is required. Anybody who wants to sign on for a soul that's found rest, learning is required. So I'm going to make four quick points about this particular learning that's featured here from Jesus. Point number one. From the beginning, this learning was something to be celebrated and something to be guarded. From the beginning, this learning, there was a learning that was to come from God from the beginning. Right? If you and I follow the story of creation, God has created this cosmos and he's taken man, a finite creature, and he's placed him in the Garden of Eden. How much learning do you think there is for him to do? Lots, right? He's about to explore the creation of God. Listen, when, when the serpent shows up and pops some questions to him, he's not all-knowing in that moment, is he? He doesn't go, oh, I know who you are. I know exactly what you're up to. I'm not falling for that. That's ridiculous. He doesn't know. He's got learning to do in his life. And God was the source of that learning. Adam was set in a place with gobs to learn that was supposed to come from God. And isn't it interesting that the one thing that's going to derail that is the tree of knowledge. You ever think about why that? Why is that the choice for God's creation? Why, why not a lazy boy recliner? <laughs> Adam, I've set you in the garden. Just stay on task. Whatever you do, don't go sit in the lazy boy recliner. That's your one thing you don't get to do. Everything else you can do, just don't go lazy on me and go sit down over there in the recliner. No, of all the things that this could be, because it could have been a brothel, right? Don't go into the brothel house over there. Stay away from that. No, no, of all the things that's here in the garden, it's the tree of knowledge that's going to be the most tempting thing for man. Isn't that interesting? What does that tell you about how God designed us as creatures? There, there's something in every one of us. It's in our DNA that goes to the very core of our existence. We are designed to learn. There's an insatiableness in us that God created us to learn. Listen, Adam didn't protect that. I don't know if he probably did celebrate it, but he certainly didn't guard this reality that, that I am vulnerable to seeing something out there that I need to get in here. I need to get that in here. I need to, to get around that idea and get it in here. He's a learner. But the same Jesus who says, come to me and learn, was the same God who created him who said, hey, you want to learn? You learn from me. You don't learn from that tree. 
you learn from me. Right, so, so learning has always been in our DNA. Point number two, this learning, this invitation from Jesus, this learning in the Christian life is an unending quest and discovery, right? None of us ever arrive. There's nobody in here who says, oh yeah, that learning thing. I, yeah, I checked that box a couple of years ago. I'm good. All right, according to God, you and I never stop learning. We're always growing and learning. Colossians chapter one, Apostle Paul Verse 9 says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is what this is what Paul, at a fundamental level, is praying for the church. I'm, I'm praying that you would increase in the knowledge of God because everything else about our lives is going to be impacted by how we know God. Everything. Fundamentally, if there's one thing the Apostle Paul stares out into the Christian universe and he says, I'm, I'm praying this for you. And he, and he prays the same thing for others elsewhere. That you may increase in the knowledge of God. God. Increase. Not arrive. Increase. Just add more depth, more insight, more awareness of God to what you already own, and then add some more. See, I think this taps into that DNA element from us back in the garden, that we were created by God to seek out, to go on a quest, to go on the adventure of learning, and learning, and learning, and learning. Listen, this is, this is why cell phones have taken off the way they have. Because you can never find the bottom, can you? Any, anybody got a notice like you took your phone out and you just you know, opened it for one more time and it says, the end. <laughs> what? The end? I've read everything? <laughs> well, how did that happen? Right? Well, that's not going to ever happen, is it? And there's something about the bottomless pit of information that's here that just draws us to it and draws us to it. And draw. Why are we so drawn to these things? Well, because we're wired to learn. We love learning. And that's something that needs to be redeemed, isn't it? Right? That's a good thing. That's back in the garden, a good thing. It just got corrupted. And now we're just off learning anything and everything around us. Right? It's an insatiable appetite. You know, this is like a snack right? It's like inside of me, a different form of hunger goes off and I pull this out so that I can satisfy the snack. All right, I want you guys to have that image for the rest of your lives. <laughs> I want every time you see your thumb reaching for the screen, I want you to recognize, ah, that's my appetite to learn going off. That's what that is. Why do I do this? Because I have an appetite to learn. And if I don't get that, I, I won't prioritize the fact that my relationship with God is that way as well. Right. Jesus says, come to me and learn from me. I got I to gotta open the app, right? I, I got to open up my awareness and my engagement, my receptivity with God. Third, this learning is from Jesus. Come learn from me, right? It's not mere book knowledge or abstract collections of ideas, right? This is an invitation from the living God personally to come learn from him versus go out there and find some information on your own, right? That's what the tree of knowledge offered. But this is an invitation to learn from him. It's different than just even picking up this book. You know, lots of people pick this book up and never encounter him. Isn't that amazing? This is an invitation to come to him. All right, I'm going to take a risk here that my, my knowledge, in spite of the fact that I have a dietitian who lives in my house, that my knowledge of vitamins could be off here, but it is well-researched. All right, so uh, if you're one of those people who take vitamin supplements, right? I don't know if you've ever read up on your vitamin supplements and you said, hey, am I just wasting my money? Is this really helping me or not? So here's the great debate, right? So... Chalked into a little pill is these 
critical vitamins that we need for our existence and they're just piled in there. You know, it's like for you to get this much vitamin C, you'd have to eat like a truckload of oranges. But it's right here in this pill. So you swallow that and I say, I'm good on the vitamin C now. I'm good. Whatever vitamins you're trying to take. But the, the massive argument is your body doesn't absorb and retain and receive those vitamins in the same way that if you had eaten an orange. There's something about the actual food and the fiber that's in it and the way your body relates to that and processes it that you actually receive something very different than what you took in that pill. All right, so my illustration is that somewhat coming to Jesus is like that. There is this sense that sometimes we just want to gain knowledge. We just want to, I just want to gain knowledge, right? I just, I'm going to get out my systematic theology book. I just want to study Christianity. I want to go to school and take a class on what Christianity really teaches. And it's like trying to absorb things that are, you know, according to the reality, most of your vitamins are being flushed down your toilet, quite honestly, right? That's where they're going. They just pass right through your body. They don't stick to you. They're not absorbed into who you are. But when you come and learn from me, when you come to Jesus and learn from him, there is something in addition to knowledge present in that exchange. There's something about the, what he imparts, the way he imparts, learning from him who is handling the knowledge himself. He is our source of wisdom and revelation. So it's not just disembodied information. It is God himself who wears this revelation himself. And we learn from him in ways that are absolutely vital. And if you back right up before this verse we just read, right? Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. So Jesus says, I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. And you have revealed them to children. And later on, he says, no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So you can interact with information and not see anything. I thank you, father. You have hidden these things. That's knowledge that just passed right through the system. Somebody got around the Old Testament and it just passed right through the system. They didn't, they didn't get a bit of it. They got knowledge. They could argue with some points that are in Leviticus and not somewhere else, but they missed the point. And Jesus explained that. Well, Father, you have hidden these things, and then you have revealed them. There's a revealing that comes by Jesus, this invitation to come to him and to learn. I wrote in your outline there, it says, we don't come to the knowledge of God through a book. The knowledge of God is revealed to us through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Come to me. Learn from me. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. Listen, Listen to what this knowledge has in it. Paul says, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something he does not yet know as he ought to know, right? You think you know something, but you don't, right? You've got knowledge and it's puffed you up, but you know that knowledge, it hasn't stuck to your soul. It's it's undigested. It's just passing right through you. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. What do you think this passage is trying to say? Half of me says, I don't know. I just, I'm curious by the inspired mindset that the Holy Spirit gives Paul these ingredients and sticks them together, right? I mean, even when we went through these passages not too long ago in our study of 1 Corinthians and, and I stared at it then and I thought, Lord, I don't know that I fully see what you're trying to say here. There's a warning here. There's knowledge that puffs up so that that knowledge by itself can become a real problem for us. Just like the tree of knowledge gives gives us a problem. It doesn't give us knowledge that's going to be super helpful. It gives us a problematic knowledge because there's something about getting our knowledge from God that's different than getting it from somewhere else. But then when he turns this corner, he says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. 
right? That knowing by God is a revelation thing, right? The God who knows you, he reveals himself to you. This God gives us a knowledge of him that includes if anyone loves God. This is an impartation of knowledge that awakens love of God in our soul. It's not just knowledge that just sits there and leaves us just this cold, dead, religious individual who can just go through the motions week after week, just show up for church, don't sing a song, don't have a passion for the kingdom of God, don't even know where my Bible is. There's nothing going off in me that has an affection for God. I'm just hanging around religious information. And receiving something from God that makes the soul get awakened in a love for God that has passion, that impacts our soul. There's a difference in this kind of love versus some disaffectionate knowledge that doesn't produce that. Listen, be concerned if in your walk with God you are disaffectionate. Be concerned. Do not be at peace with that. Do not be here this morning thinking, well, at least I go to church. Listen, if you're going to church, singing songs, listening to God's word, reading God's word, and and no affection toward God is being awakened in you, be concerned. Make an appointment this week to come talk to a pastor. You, You got something that's very problematic here. Don't be lulled to sleep. That you can tell the stories from the Old Testament. You can explain the gospel to someone. You understand some things that are written down on the pages of the Bible. If your soul hasn't been awakened to an affection toward God, that's a problem. That's not normal. That's not the kind of knowledge that Jesus is taught. When you come learn from me, it, it awakens things in us toward God. And it's a little intangible. I just want to make this point to us. I think I wrote in your outline there, knowledge needs to be under the influence or catalyzed by other critical characteristics. Otherwise, it is not digested right. When you go to digest the things you read off this page, your systematic theology book, whatever it is that you're reading about God, when you go to digest that, When you learn from Jesus, there's something about him mixed with that knowledge that imparts things like humility, love, mercy. That comes with him. When you learn this learning from him, it imparts that as well. Right now, I'm going to tweak out humility and rush through the other two. But I just want you to to, to get a mindset here because I'm greatly concerned that that's... Some of us, the way we learn is detached from learning from Jesus. Right, just think for, with me for a second about, about the idea of these qualities, humility, love, and mercy. Remember that the Pharisees would interact with Jesus in a way that seemed they were very confused about who he was. It was not because they lacked knowledge. They could argue and ask Jesus questions because they weren't imbeciles. They had knowledge. They could pull up references from the Old Testament and call Jesus to questions about him because they had knowledge. But when Jesus went to act in people's lives, they were confused by that. That this one could get around these drunks and these sinners. Do you know who's touching you? Do you have any idea who it is that's touching you? Why why such outrage? Because their knowledge taught them that you don't even let somebody like that touch you. But then they watched Jesus. And he didn't just let them touch him. He let them cry all over him. Rub his feet with oil. Right, this, was, this was confusing to them because all they had was knowledge. They had no love. They had no mercy mixed into their knowledge. They had no humility mixed into their knowledge. Humility rescues knowledge from trying to be the only source of our attitudes and actions. Right? How many of us are in big trouble relationally or in doing life because the only thing that's determining what we're going to do next is what's, what do I think is right and what do I think is wrong? That's all I know. That's my only quest. I just want to discover in this argument, in this situation, what is right 
And what is wrong? And we can't get along with anybody. We didn't learn that from Jesus. We learned something. That's why we can win the argument. Because we know enough to say your point is wrong. And here's why. Here's the 18 reasons why. But we didn't learn from Jesus. This is an interesting insight on humility. Charles Spurgeon says, there's something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity. So deep that, listen, our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can compass and grapple with and them we feel a kind of self-content and go our way with the thought. Behold, I am wise. But when we come to the master science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought that vain man would be wise, but he is like a wild ass's colt. And with solemn exclamation, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. No subject of contemplation will tend more to humble the mind than thoughts of God. If you and I have problems with humility, uh, our, our problem isn't just a problem with humility, it's a lack of knowing God. Can I just tell you, you cannot know God deeply and remain proud. If you have, if anybody thinks he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. You might know something, but swallowed a vitamin instead of learning from Jesus. Somehow that knowledge you have of God hasn't found its way very deeply into you because it will humble you in massive ways. I don't think I put this in your outline, but pride is not remedied in our lives by teaching people to not be proud or calling them to avoid pride or even that pride is wrong and precedes destruction. The scriptures actually teach that. Pride is remedied by seeking and knowing God. You must go vertical and get a proper sense of the scale of just how big you are and just how much you actually know. And I don't get that by looking at you or somebody else in my world. Because I might know more than them or think I do. And so therefore, I'm really here in that comparison. But when I get around God, the scale suddenly changes. And I realize just how little I actually know that I'm so obnoxiously arrogant about. <laughs> John Frame is a theologian who stole an illustration. I don't know where he got it from, but he admits that he stole it from a guy. And he says, what we know, this is a humility exercise, what we know, if, if what we know could fit inside of a circle, right? So on the inside of this circle, it's, it's all that we know. And on the outside of that circle is all that there is to know that we don't know. And he says something interesting here. He says, you know, this is all you nerdy mathematician people, you're gonna all get this. The rest of y'all just ask the nerds what I'm talking about. <laughs> Right, so there is a circumference, a surface area for that circle. That surface area is in touch with how much you don't know. When you know just a little bit, tiny little bit, the circle's really, really small. And so you're not really aware of how much you don't know. You got a hint that you don't know much out there, but you're not really aware. But the more you know, the bigger the circle gets the bigger the surface area gets and the more you become aware of how much you don't know. Right, the most arrogant, proud people are the ones with little bitty circles. Next time you get around somebody like that, they won't know what you mean unless they're in the church today. Just kind of go. <laughs> That's your way of saying, I can tell by your arrogance, little bitty circle. <laughs> we know how many guys have experienced this the more you know the more you become aware of the little bitty thimble from the pacific ocean that you actually possess god is enormous and what there is to know about him is humbling when i see how little i actually own 
of what there is to know in this great invitation. Love informs knowledge of reasons and realities that also must inform our attitudes and our actions. What we do, why we do what we do, what we need, it needs to be informed by the love of God. Jesus did stuff with people that confused knowledge. I mean, it would confuse us. I mean, we've learned, to, to, we've learned from him, so we've, we've learned to accept some things. But, but Jesus embodied a, a knowledge and a love, a knowledge and mercy, a knowledge and humility, that when he interacted with people, all that was observable and learnable. So when Jesus interacts with the woman at the well, and she's living in sin with the sixth man in her life, and she's been married five times. All right, there's the knowledge. She is so wrong, she's beyond wrong, right? There's the knowledge. But when you watch Jesus interact with her, you don't walk away with this sense of, wow, did he kick her in the butt, huh? I mean, hey, you're going to mess around with men like that? This is what you get. Anybody walk away from that story that way? When, when Jesus sits and watches this crowd that wants to stone this woman caught in adultery to death. Hey, the facts are she's been caught in adultery. There's the facts. It's wrong. Right and wrong. It's wrong. What do we do? Well, there's even some Bible passages that you could cite in that moment. And then Jesus does something that blows everybody's mind when he says, okay, well, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. Wait, does Jesus not know what the right thing is to do? I mean, do you get, you got to learn some of these things from Jesus. There's more to the Christian life. There's more to walking out your life. There's more to relating to people. There's more to glorifying God than just memorizing the facts and knowing a doctrine and being able to pull it out in the right moment. See, you did not learn Christ this way. Come to me and learn from me. One last quote and then we're going to pray. J.A. Packer in Knowing God says, The conviction behind this book is that ignorance of God, ignorance both of his ways and of the practice of communion with him, lies at the root of much of the church's weakness today. Two unhappy trends seem to have produced this state of affairs. Trend one is that Christian minds have been conformed to the modern spirit. The spirit that is, that spawns great thoughts of man and leaves room for only small thoughts of God. The modern way with God is to set him at a distance, if not to deny him altogether. And the irony is that modern Christians preoccupied with maintaining religious practices in an irreligious world, have themselves allowed God to become too remote. J.I. Packer said this in 1973. My, how times haven't really changed. They've just gotten more complicated, haven't they? Which, by the way, Jay, I, I wish I had the number of things interrupting your world in my life today and trying to live out these struggles because exponentially they've increased. And they have set God at a great distance. All right, now, clearly, clearly, this passage unarguably presents a relationship between rest for your soul and learning. Jesus doesn't just say, hey, I've got some rest dust if you'll come over here. You know, you know, you know in some ways, and, I, and I, I don't want to one-dimensionalize the way Jesus did things. He did all kinds of things powerfully and amazingly. But I'm not inclined this morning to invite you forward that we're going to lay hands on you and give you rest. I think God can show up and give us a peace that passes understanding. I think he can do something marvelous in a moment. But the pattern of scripture is that if you and I are going to find rest, we're going to find it through learning. And and just to to put this into reasonableness, um, you're not going to learn everything you need to know by the end of this week. 
There isn't some pill you can swallow that's going to give you all the knowledge of God that you need to have. Don't be frustrated by the fact that the Bible describes an appropriateness for at one point we're going to learn milk and at some point we're going to graduate to meat. I mean, the Bible expects there's a process here of our growing. So, so don't get frustrated that you, you're not ready to have your doctorate degree in the knowledge of God, it's but just, just the next step. It's just the next step. And that's okay, that's biblical. It's, it's not, I'm going, to finish, I'm going to finish the study of Jesus by the end of next week. This year, this year, at the end of this year, the end of this decade. Uh, that's not how you learn. I mean, you learn in a multifaceted way where God takes you through life. He sets you in settings. He involves people. He shows up in those times. He relates to you in days when you're on top of the world and you're having this mountaintop. Life is great and you're learning some things there. And then he takes you on a journey and, and you walk through a valley and the valley's longer than you thought it was going to be. And it's dark and it's scary and you're learning every second of the way. He draws near to you in those moments. How many of you guys would say, I want, I want you to raise your hands on this. How many of you guys would say the deepest learning in your life came from the deepest moments of suffering that you've been through? And raise your hand really high. Why is it that we pray suffering away all the time, right? I mean, I'm, I'm full-time trying to talk God out of suffering, always. And yet, some of that is Jesus inviting me to come learn. Keith, come learn. Keith, as a matter of fact, Keith, you only listen to me a certain way when you're in this posture, in this frame of mind. There are things I want to teach you about myself, about yourself, about the life I have for you that you can't learn unless you're right here in this moment with me, walking through these circumstances with these people, with the time frame that you have, right, that's what God's interested in. So here's what I want us to do this morning. I'm not gonna call anybody forward this morning for prayer. But I, I want you to, in your mind, pull out whatever you signed when you came to Christ. I don't know, you didn't sign anything, I know, but you sort of did, right? You believe something. You came into agreement with God about something. Can you, can you just real quickly with me go back and recall that? Go back and revisit it. What exactly were you signing on for? Relief for the moment? I get that. Sometimes that's what God uses initially to get our attention, right? Is that all? Jesus' invitation to come to him. This is to come to Jesus is to come to learn. It's an invitation to go to school with him. Jesus was interested in enrolling every last one of us who would follow him in a school where we learned of him. Our souls that are going to either go to the tree of knowledge or they're going to go to God are going to learn something this week. Am I enrolled in school? to come to Jesus. Can you rethink with me? Because we're going to pray in just a moment. I, I want you to, I don't know if you want to renegotiate, but I think God wants to renegotiate with you the deal. That in the coming decade, you're not going to be one of those people. You're not going to let yourself be one of those people who didn't prioritize learning. Can I, can I just let everybody off the hook of justification? Some of you justification people are going to want to argue with me. Um, stupid Christians go to heaven just like smart Christians. Okay, can we just say it that way? If you don't learn anything further, but you have entrusted your life to Christ and the work that he did for you on the cross and the life that he has given you by the Holy Spirit, you will go to heaven just like any other Christian, whether you learn anything further or not. I think that's accurate to say. I would question a little bit about what I just said because if you have no desire to learn anything further that doesn't drive you toward God and it hasn't awakened affections in your soul to want to know him more, then I might say everything I just said was false. Anyway. Um, <laughs> in the next decade... Is learning going to be a priority for you? Eric, you can come back up here. Is that going to be a priority for you? To, have, to live a life where learning from Jesus is a priority for us. 
It'd be easy for me to sell, hey, how many of you guys would like to have rest for your souls? I mean, I think most of us are worn out with the pace of life, the complexities of life these days. That, hey, the line would be long to sign up for rest. The line would be short to sign up for learning. But Jesus comes and says, these two are related. If you want rest for your soul, you're going to come and learn from me and find rest. Let's stand up together. Well, Lord, thank you for this gracious invitation that you come and pursue us with an invitation to come to you and to learn from you. I know we might need some help from you with some self-awareness in this moment. An awareness that we're honest with ourselves about whether we have fallen into some pattern like Mr. Packer describes, that that you have become too distant from us. You are too remote in our experience, in our seeking, in our growing in intimacy and knowledge of you and from you. Or would you let us experience a little bit of the discomfort that that would come as we ponder whether some of our restlessness, maybe not all of it, but some of our restlessness has to do with the distance between us and you. The lack of curiosity on our part. The lack of hunger to find in you our soul's satisfaction. Lord, we've been looking elsewhere. We've prized other ideas and other pursuits. And Lord, there's a restlessness in us. Lord, thank you for speaking to our restlessness. God, I thank you that you love us enough to keep it real. Where our hearts lack joy, lack a sense of purpose that's eternal, lack a a sense of being accepted by you that matters, that silences the voices and the nagging and the pressures on the inside of us. God, thank you that you're not okay with us not being affected by you. You want us to experience rest for our souls. Lord, we want that too. So this morning, Lord, we, we take what your word has revealed to us the goodness, the wellness, the health, the rest for our souls. Lord, it comes as we learn from you. So Lord, would you help us, not just right now in February, would you help us not just in the year 2020, but for the next decade, Lord, that we would be learners God, it's in our DNA. It's what we're after. God, would you turn that learning toward you in deeper and deeper and deeper ways? Would you let our discoveries of you bring a fresh sense of awakening of our souls and satisfaction to our souls? Well, oh, this is truly what we're after. Let me just speak to some who may be here this morning that hearing Bible information or even religious information, that, that's not necessarily new for you. But if you ever pondered that this God who reveals these things, he wants personally to be connected to you. He wants a relationship 
that's personal with you. And have you ever come to a moment where you turn to that God personally? Jesus Christ is the one who reveals God to us. His story's critical. He came to give us life. He came to forgive our sins. He came to restore us to God the Father. And he gives us a new life when we turn to him. If you're living life and and you don't have a recollection of a moment when that's what you did, you turned to him and received that life. You turned to him in faith and believed in him. You turned away from yourself to the God who wants your life. He wants your life and he wants to give you his life. If you've never done that right now, you can do that right now. You can tell God in your heart, speak to him. Tell him, God, I want that. What he just described just now. I want that. I want to give you my life and I want you to come into my life. From this day forward, Lord, I want to know you. I want, to, I want those affections to be awakened in my heart. I want, I want to love you. And I want to seek you more and more. God, today, would you come into my life today? Forgive me of my sins. Give me your Holy Spirit to live and dwell in me and lead me into knowing you and living a life for your glory.